local publishing phenomenon selling over 100,000 copies and was Jenny Chris Williams' book of the year um, seven years ago. And then um, similar success with her second book, which she wrote with former NPA head Vusi Piccoli. And in 2014, she published Behind the Door, the Oscar Pistorius and Reva Steenkamp story with Barry Bateman. And the book was released internationally. Her new book contains revelations about organized crime and its relationship with the police. And I'm happy to say that that is the topic of today's lecture. Please welcome Mandy Weiner. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for um, drawing yourself away from uh, Angelo Gritti's testimony about Bosasa and whatever else it is that's happening in Cape Town. Have you been watching the State Capture Commission? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. How incredible is it? Do you believe him, though? Um, do you? Does it have a ring of truth about it? I, I like to say that he's like Egliotti 2.0 because it's, uh, I mean, we've heard this the story before. This is just on a whole new scale. Um, and I, you, wouldn't, you may not have heard that in the last hour or so, the NPA has confirmed that they are withdrawing charges against do designing Zuma. Is it too loud? Okay, he's, okay, he's coming to fix it. It's okay. He's coming. Um, sorry, I, I project. So maybe just turn it down a little bit. Thank you, thank you. It's my broadcast voice. Is that better or is that too low? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Go up a bit. Is that better? Yay, okay. All right. Um, so is it fine? Everyone happy? No? Too loud again? Okay, it's too loud. Sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, perfect. All right, I'm, I'll, I'll project anyway, so I'm sure you'll hear me at the back. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Okay, is that better? Okay, I'll just stay here. Okay, I won't move around. Okay, so you may not have heard that in the last hour or so, the NPA has confirmed that they were withdrawing charges against do Zuma. Zuma. Uh, I don't know why. Um, because, what did they say? Oh, because Jonas hasn't finished his testimony to the State Capture Commission, because it's about the alleged bribe to Jonas. Um, so, out of all the state capture, I mean, I'm going to talk about organized crime, don't worry. But, um, I mean, government is organized crime. So, um, if, of all the state capture that evidence that we've heard so far, the NPA has only brought charges in two cases, the Estina Dairy Farm and the Design Zuma, and now they've withdrawn charges in both those cases. So as it stands, there's no state capture prosecutions, which is very interesting. So that's your news bulletin, the start of, of my talk. Um, so I'm going to speak to you a little bit about uh, organized crime and, and the capture of uh, law enforcement agencies uh, in South Africa over the past few years. Um, and there's quite a few different threads here. But for me, the story that perhaps illustrates this best um, is the story about... Uh, that's, Constitution, obviously. Um, it's a story about Jackie Salivi and Genagliotti. I mean, that's the first uh, case where we really understood um, how state capture happens and how corruption happens. When you have a national police commissioner that is convicted of corruption um, and where he was essentially bought by the Kevils. So they bought access to the national police commissioner. And when you think about it, Jackie Salibi was only convicted of 117,000 rand which is such a minute amount when you consider that with the Guptas, we're dealing with billions and billions. And Bosasa, the, the corruption was something like six million rand a month. So at the time, in 2010, when Jackie Sidibe was convicted, we thought this was, was massive. Um, the only thing by comparison, of course, was Jacob Zuma and Shabir Sheikh. Uh, and that was what consumed us at the time. That was our, our definition of, of corruption. Um, 
But I think that the story of, of Radovan Krejcia, this Czech fugitive from justice, uh, who arrived in South Africa around about the time we started hearing about Jackie Sadibi and, and, and his corruption issues with the cable. You know, that for, for me is perhaps one of the best illustrations of, of how um, a criminal and a criminal organization can capture law enforcement and, and capture a state. So, so the, the, there's two like, real issues to, to consider here. The first one is how criminals have, and organized crime have captured government. And the second one, obviously, is, is how um, corporates have, have been captured and, and, and like the Guptas and, and Bosasa. So, so those are the two things to, to think about here. But so Ranavan Krejci arrives in South Africa in 2007. And he came from the Czech Republic. His family had made money off the back of the Velvet Revolution there. And he had perfected the art of, of state capture before we even really understood what state capture was. Uh, he had backed a political party that had come into power. And uh, he was supposed to own the petroleum company as, as repayment. Um, and he landed up having a, an enormous fight with uh, the political powers there. And he became a bit of a, of a pariah. Uh, he was charged with tax fraud and of allegedly having a customs official killed. Um, and the police were raiding his villa on the outskirts of, of Prague, and he literally just walked out the front door. He just disappeared into the forest around Prague and hid there for two weeks, and then managed to get a fake ID and rode a bicycle to Poland, and then made his way to Dubai and then to the Seychelles. And in the Seychelles, he then uh, set up shop there, and he again set about befriending the president in the Seychelles and the, the president's son, and so he tried to kill him with a harpoon gun, as one does. Um, and, and he really was, was a master in the art of, of, of influence and charm and, and capturing political power. And when things became a bit hot there for him, he got on a boat and went to Madagascar and then arrived in South Africa using uh, a pseudonym. He had a fake ID and he came in under the name of Jules Egbert Savvy. And he literally had a fake moustache and a wink. And the cops arrested him. And what do you do if you arrest an international fugitive from justice? You don't put him in a jail cell with the most connected underworld figure in Joburg, which is exactly what they did. They put him in a jail cell with George Luca. Um, and what happened was he connected him to everybody else in Joburg. So he introduced him to Genegliotti and to Lolly Jackson and to anyone who was anyone. And Krejci started, started setting up his empire in Joburg. He, built, he built, bought this beautiful mansion on Clough Road in Bedford View, which has this kind of vista of, of the whole of, of Joburg. Um, he set up his office at uh, the Harbour Restaurant in Bedford Centre and literally put armoured plated glass uh, outside the restaurant because he was concerned that an assassin was going to take him out from the high-rise apartment block across the road. Um, and he started just connecting and had all of these different business, businesses that he set up. And, and, and he managed to recruit the very best at whatever criminal enterprise was going on. So if he wanted to do tax fraud, he'd find the best accountant that knew how tax law worked. Um, or you know, if he wanted to take out a hit on somebody, he found an assassin from the taxi industry. And he was running, running lots of different scams at, at the same time. And he, he began to to reach out and, and, and in a way he kind of uh, connected, he, he unified the underworld, particularly in Joburg but in Cape Town as well. Um, so it was, it was quite um, disparate in, in many ways and he brought it together because dodgy people came to him like moths to a flame. You know, word went out that there was this Czech billionaire in town and that he had a lot of money and people started getting recruited by him. And I mean, these are really charming looking people. You know, they're all like, are the kind of people you really want to bump into in, in, you know, in a dark alley. But Lonnie Jackson, I mean, Cyril Bierke from, from Cape Town, who I'll speak about more, um, the guy in the top in the middle was Joan Mayer, who was one of the first people who came out, he was a gold refiner, to, um, to discuss 
publicly about what Croatia was up to on, on carte blanche. And then, of course, Glenn Agliotti and George Luca at, at the bottom. So he surrounded himself with, with these people. And the bodies started piling up. And we started hearing stories about all these people who were killed um, in the media, uh, from Lolly Jackson um, to uh, Uwe Gembala, who was a German supercar dealer who arrived in South Africa and then disappeared. And he came ostensibly to set up a business with, uh, with uh, Radovan Kreitscher, but he vanished. And he was held at a snuff house in Edenville for two or three days. And then they killed him by putting a plastic bag over him and literally sat on him until he couldn't breathe anymore and buried him in a, in a shallow grave near Pretoria. Um, there was Ian Yordan, the attorney, who went off to go meet a client and landed up uh, his, his body was found uh, burnt out on the, the top of his overturned bucky out near Brits. You know, there were all of these incidents that happened, and Kreitcher's name was always linked to them. But he was never prosecuted, and that was because he had bought off the cops. So he was excellent at corrupting every level of, of the police. So from station level, where you know, you'd have people from Bedford View Police in uniform in a patrol vehicle coming into his shop, um, and he would give them money to go and buy Nando's for lunch, to police generals who were given tog bags full of cash. He was so protected that any time there was any sense of, of any kind of investigation, he would be tipped off about it. And that's how he managed to get away with it for so long. Until Paul O'Sullivan, the forensic consultant private investigator um, who brought down Jackie Salibi, started looking into Kreitcher. And he started investigating him. And it was really Paul O'Sullivan who, who, who was the catalyst, who really got the investigation going. And he started getting uh, witnesses to, uh, to turn against Kreitcher in the early stages. But yet the cops were still doing absolutely nothing. Um, even the Lolly Jackson investigation, that's Lolly Jackson's house in Ed Lean where he was shot. This, Lolly Jackson was the, the king of, of strip in South Africa. He, you know, if, you, if you know about teasers, you know about how, how flashy and gaudy it was, yet he was killed in this, this nondescript face brick house in, in Ed Lean in Kempton Park. And we all knew the version that apparently George Luca had shot and killed him and then had confessed to the head of uh, crime intelligence in Kauteng and then fled the country. But the version that then came out later, um, when Luca arrived back in South Africa with that godfather-esque testimony in, in court, was about how it was actually Kreitcher who had killed Lolly Jackson and then made Luca take the, the fall. And because the head of crime intelligence was corrupt, uh, Kreitcher got away with it. Um, and, that, and that's exactly what happened, is that the cops would cover for him continuously, and it was only Paul O'Sullivan that was really doing any kind of investigations into him. But you can't tell the story of, of Kreitcher and how he corrupted the police and how he got away with murder without telling the story of what happened to law enforcement in, in South Africa over the past few years. So one of the, the people that also allegedly was on Kreitcher's payroll was the head of crime intelligence in, in the country, Richard M. Dluley, General Richard M. Dluley. And many of you would have heard his name because he's become something of a, of a bogeyman. Um, in South Africa. So Richard Mglouli was the head of crime intelligence for eight years. He was suspended for eight years, during which he earned 12 million rand for sitting at home, including a performance bonus <laughs> for sitting at home really well. So under Richard Mglouli, I mean, he, they were looting the, the police's uh, secret fund. They went on overseas trips, they bought cars for themselves, they would rent out their own properties as safe houses and then draw, draw the rent. Um, he employed family members as crime intelligence sources. Uh, it was unbelievable the level of corruption that was going on. And I mean, this was how crime intelligence had been captured because there was no real intelligence work being done. Richard M. Lully was seen as a, as a Zuma acolyte. He was there to control the police for, for Zuma. So what happened was there was this deliberate, malicious campaign, an intentional campaign to capture law enforcement agencies and eviscerate them. 
And, and, and this started with, with Richard M. Gluley taking over crime intelligence. And of course, you know, he was also responsible for VIP security, um, for protecting cabinet ministers. And we used to joke as journalists every time during that era, around 2012, 2013, that every time we made a phone call, we'd greet Richard M. Gluley first because we assumed that they were listening to everything that we were saying. So he, he really was able to capture the, the police. And then you'll know that Glynis Breitenbach started prosecuting Richard and Cluley, and then she got suspended because she was adamant that she wanted to, to prosecute Richard and Cluley. And she eventually got pushed out of, of the NPA. And there was this cabal at the NPA under Nomkobo Jiba and Lawrence Mkhwebi who captured the NPA and one of their main agendas was to protect Richard M. Cluley, but also to protect other people like him and like Jacob Zuma as well. And as a result of that, we saw the capacity at the NPA being completely depleted and a lot of good prosecutors being pushed out and cases just not being prosecuted. Um, and and Glynis is a perfect example of that, what happened to her, where you've got years and years of experience in complex commercial crimes. When she handled the Tannenbaum case, you know, she was handling the uh, World Cup Stadium corruption cases. She had all of these critically important dockets on her table, but she was pushed out and suspended because of Mbluli, and all of those dockets as a result just fell to, to, to the side and, and nothing ever happened to them. And she of course left, and a lot of other people looked at that and thought, well, if Glynis Bradenbach can get pushed out of the MPA, we're out of here, we're going to, to the private sector as well. So the result of that was a, a depleted NPA that was compromised. And then we saw, um, I mean, that's exactly what happened, where the NPA was captured by, by Lawrence Mkhwebi, by Nom Jiba, and by Prince Mokotedi in this cabal um, to, to capture the NPA. A very similar thing happened at SARS as well, where we had this narrative coming out about the SARS rogue unit. And the SARS rogue unit, it turned out, never actually existed. It was just this narrative that came out about Johann von Lochrenberg and his team that was running a brothel and that was spying on, on Jacob Zuma. Um, and all of that came out in, in the Sunday Times. And that, again, was part of this malicious campaign to capture law enforcement agencies. And we saw that at SARS. So, I mean, if you look at what actually happened with Rana Van Kreitscher, it was the SARS rogue unit that, that, that really was the only law enforcement agency that did any real investigation into Kreitscher. They are the ones who were able to um, sequestrate him. They were able to, they would drive past his, his office in, in Bedford View and see who, which cars were there and take down their number plates. They were able to build a network of, of all of the different frauds that, that he was running. And it was the rogue unit that eventually put enough pressure on him to, to bring him down. It was the rogue unit that was looking at Julius Molema and that was looking at all the, the cigarette cartels. And, and they were the, the, probably the most capable law enforcement investigative capacity in the country. But as a result of this rogue unit narrative, that entire capacity has now been depleted and has left SARS completely, um, which is terrifying because that's why the revenue collection is, 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 is so affected. Um, and we, we just don't have that capacity to investigate these, these complex tax frauds anymore. And we saw this, this kind of narrative repeating itself so what would happen over that period was there would be a kind of plant in the Sunday Times about certain things that, that had happened. So for example, um, with the Zimbabwean renditions, we saw Anwar Dramat and Shadrach Sabir. Anwar Dramat was the head of the Hawks, and Shadrach Sabir, who was the head of the Hawks in a Gauteng, being accused of these illegal renditions on the front page of the Sunday Times. They both get suspended, they get moved out, and then Burning in Flameza comes in as the head of the Hawks and takes over and breaks the whole thing and appoints all of his own people at a provincial level and manages to take over the, the Hawks. Uh, with Johan Boyce in, in KwaZulu-Natal, he was the head of the Hawks in KwaZulu-Natal, we had this allegation about the Cato Manor death squads in the Sunday Times. Johan Boysen gets suspended and he gets replaced and gets, gets moved out. And then with the rogue units at, at SARS. 
So the net result of all of that is that you had a lot of good people being pushed out from, from SARS, from the NPA, from crime intelligence, from the Hawks, and all of these different agencies being captured, which meant that the capacity to investigate organized crime and people like Rodovan von Kreutzer was just no longer there. And why so much was allowed to go on for such a long period of time. And in around 2013, 2014, this was exactly when all of this was happening, and Croatia was at his, his kind of prime. And we saw mad things happening, like in the parking lot of his Money Point offices in Bedford View, he arrived there in the middle of the day, and this red polo, the number plates lifted, and 12 barrels of a shotgun miraculously started shooting bullets at him, and he managed to escape and then the car went up in flames in this bizarre James Bond-esque um, assassination attempt. It was like living in, in like a Hollywood movie. No one could quite believe that, that this was true. Um, and then we saw a bomb going off and blowing up his offices opposite Eastgate in the middle of drive time traffic um, and two of his associates being killed. Um, and this was because Kreutzer was starting to become under pressure because at the time, Rio Piecha, who was the National Police Commissioner, realized that he um, was a good PR opportunity for him. She was under pressure because of Marikana, and she looked at Kreutzer and thought, oh, there's this Czech fugitive who's like the mob boss in South Africa. If we bring him in, at least that looks good for me. And SARS, the rogue unit, had already started to weaken him and had cut off his access to, to cash flow, so he landed up in jail. Um, he was prosecuted, and eventually he was convicted, not on any of the high-profile murders, like Lonnie Jackson or Cyril Bierke or any of those, but rather on an attempted murder case. It was a drug deal that, that went wrong, where basically they kidnapped this guy, threw hot water over him, um, and tried to kill him. Um, and he landed up in prison, um, and he's now serving 35 years. And of course, he's coming out of these stories now about how he bribed Zuma and went and Kandler and gave him two and a half million rand in order to ensure that he got sent back to the Czech Republic. And who knows if it's true or not, because everyone bribed Zuma, apparently. Um, and then in, in parallel to that, I mean, and, and this will interest you, obviously, is, is the story of, of Cyril Bierke, which is directly linked to, to that of Kreutzer and the fact that um, the law enforcement agencies were, were so captured. And in all of these stories, you have these kind of characters that straddle different worlds. Um, so you'll see that in many of them, the good guys are working for the bad guys, and the bad guys are working for the good guys. So in most of these stories, you'll find that the, the people who we think are bad guys are actually police sources. So they're on the police payroll, and they're giving information to, to the cops. Um, and as a result of that, they don't get prosecuted. Or vice versa, you've got cops, generals, who are on the payroll of, of crime syndicates. And Cyril Bierke was the perfect example of this because you know, he had um, origins in the um, ANC. Uh, he was an intelligence operative. So while he, he was seen as kind of the, the underworld bouncer boss in Cape Town, he was also working for state security. So he was an intelligence operative and was very connected in, in the intelligence world, even though he was seen, and, and in the 1990s, early 2000s, he was really running a nightclub bouncer security in Cape Town. He then got kind of kicked out of Cape Town and went up to Joburg, and he, he maintained his links to Moshe Sheikh and to all the intelligence networks, but he started working with Kreutzer. And they started setting up all of these different businesses together, and, and Bierke always wanted to return to Cape Town. So he started coming back to Cape Town a little bit and, and trying to re-establish his networks here. Um, and he landed up getting killed uh, in 20, March 2011. He was shot dead in an assassination in, in Cape Town. Um, and the, the results of, of what happened to Bierke we're now seeing today, particularly in Cape Town, because that murder really shifted the balance of power. Um, because after Birka was taken out, we saw underworld security and bouncer security in Cape Town being consolidated by Mark Lifman and Andre Nordia. And you'll know Mark Lifman has been in the media a lot. Um, I get into trouble if I call him an alleged a, a businessman. 
Um, some refer to him as an alleged paedophile because he hasn't been convicted. Um, but he has obviously lots of interest in, in security businesses. And after Becker was killed, he and Andre Nodia really consolidated uh, what was going on in, in terms of, of security. Until Nafiz Modak showed up. So now Nafiz Modak was Cyril Becker's kind of right hand guy, he was very close to him. And they were so close that Nafiz Modak says that. He, Cyril Birka would sleep at his house without a gun, which apparently is an indication of how you trust someone, if you'll sleep at their house without having a firearm on you. So in about 2017, Nafiz Modak decided that he was going to try and retake control of, of all the nightclub security in, in Cape Town um, from Mark Lifman. And Nafiz Modak describes himself as a businessman. Um, his parents owned supermarkets uh, in, in Cape Town, and he owned several car dealerships. And he started consolidating power and rebuilding Cyril Birka's old crew. And he started trying to make a play in late 2017, early 2018, for um, the control in, in Cape Town. And what happened was this all came to a, to a head at an auction in Perro, where Modex properties were up for auction, Liftman tried to buy them, guns were pulled, and it all got very ugly, and flip-flops were left behind, and people disappeared in Range Rovers. Um, and at that point, Modex decided to, to really start trying to take over nightclubs. And he was then arrested for alleged extortion. So what would happen is he and Colin Boyson, who is one of the Boyson brothers, because the Boyson brothers are, are split. Jerome Donkey Boyson is with Lifman. Colin Boyson is with Modak. And Modak and, and Colin Boyson and his crew would apparently go into nightclubs in Cape Town, like the Grand or um, a number of other places, and allegedly extort the owners. So they'd say, give us 20, 30 grand a month, we are now running security for you, and if you don't, we're going to come and intimidate your, your clientele. And through 2017-2018, through there were a number of shootings in Cape Town that happened um, in, in Seapoint or um, on Long Street. There were a number of incidents that happened, and, and people were collateral damage or, or were taken out. And, and what you're seeing now is, is kind of a, a standoff. So on the one side, you've got Modak and his crew. On the other side, you've got Liffman. But they each have their own police officers that they're connected to. So if you've been following the news, you'll know that, for example, there's a, the investigating officer is, is Kinnear, and he's just lodged a complaint against Jeremy Vury, who's the, the, the general um, in charge of, I think it's detectives in, in Cape Town, but he's obviously seen as the, the kind of gang aficionado in, in Cape Town. Um, so you've got on the one side these cops that are controlled by Liffman, and then on the other side, Vary, who's investigating M M Modak, and it's all very messy. And what it comes down to is that you've got organized crime that is in bed with the cops, and they're all investigating each other, and they're using the police against each other, and it's very hard to tell what's actually going on, because it's all very layered and, and quite complex. Um, Still, is it okay? At the back, can you hear me? All right. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, so it's very hard to tell. I mean, the, the, the net result of it is that no one's actually in prison because Modak is apparently a police source as well. So no one's going to prosecute him, although he was released on bail and that's still going on because he's apparently a police source. And then you've got Liffman on the other side who also is, is connected to, to different police officers. And, and Cape Town is kind of the, the battlefield of, of all of this. Um, so as it stands, it's, it's kind of just simmering. Um, and, and, and it really, you know, one of the ways that it manifested was last year in the murder of Pete Mahalik, the advocate. And, I mean, you, you, you'll know the story, Pete Mahalik dropping his child off at school in, um, in Seapoint and, and being, being killed. Um, and, you know, Pete Mahalik obviously acted for Nafiz Modak. He acted for a number of high-profile underworld figures. Um, people were arrested for it, 
But we don't know who hired the hitmen, and that's, you know, that's the issue at this stage. So th that has obviously been a, a, a real catalyst for, for what's going on in Cape Town. But again, the problem is the fact that the police are, are captured to a large extent because the investigating officer on Mihalik's case is also Charles Kinnear, who was the same investigating officer in um, Modak's case. And they're saying that he's captured. Um, so it's, it's hard to tell what, what's going to happen there. And he's also, Kinnear is also the head of the, the anti-gang unit. So, so it really is, I mean, you can't make this, this stuff up. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you kind of shift over to state capture and what we're hearing in, in the commission, um, it, it's a different kind of organized crime. You know, I always joke that the, I mean, it's not really a joke, but the police are actually the biggest organized crime syndicates in, in the country. That's what I used to say, but I think it may actually be just politicians that are the biggest organized crime syndicate. So we've got these commissions that are running. We've had all of the kind of entrails spilling out in, in the state capture inquiry. Um, and we've heard about the Guptas and, and the Gupta leaks and, and all of that. And now we're hearing about Bosasa from, from Angelo Gritzi, and it really paints a terrifying picture of, of corruption. But, I'm sorry? We can identify the people Okay, so at the top, that's Gavin Watson. There. So that, that's Gavin Watson, who is um, one of the Watson brothers. Who, that guy. It's not that important anymore. That guy used to be important. Not so important anymore. So Gavin Watson is the, the CEO of Bosasa who also is one of the Watson brothers from PE with struggle credentials. And uh, we're now hearing all about, I mean, it's the most phenomenal detail that we're hearing about the slick operation that has been run. I mean, the, where they literally had a safe with cash piled up that they would count out and pay over to various cabinet ministers and um, government officials and, and just corrupt them. I mean, it is important to stress, however, that... We're dealing with a very like, strange beast here in these inquiries. It's not a criminal trial. So Agriti is making all of these allegations as the former COO of Bosasa, um, but we don't, those allegations are not being tested at this stage. So they're not necessarily undergoing the same kind of interrogation that they would during a criminal trial, and they need to be corroborated. So in some ways, they have been corroborated. So, like, for example, he alleges that he was shown confidential NPA documents by Dudu Mieni on the sixth floor of the Sheraton Hotel in Pretoria. And the, the investigators from the State Capture Commission went and checked the carpet um, design in the photos against the carpet design on the sixth floor of the Sheraton Hotel, and it matched. So there's that kind of corroborating evidence that we're looking for. Uh, he's got this black book where he detailed all of the bribes that were made, but we need to check that against bank accounts and other people's versions. So there's a lot more to come here in, in that still. Um, and then also, it, it's very contentious at the moment as to whether or not a greasy has been offered a Section 204 deal by the NPA. The NPA is not saying whether he has or not. And what that would mean is, as, as per Section 204 of the Criminal Procedure Act, that he gets indemnity from prosecution for honest testimony before the courts. And, I mean, the, the other example to look at here is Glenn Agliotti. So Glenn Agliotti was offered a 204 for testifying against Jackie Salibi. He never got that 204 because the judge, Judge Mayor Joffe, found that he had not, in fact, testified openly and honestly and truthfully. Yet he was never prosecuted because there was no political will to prosecute him at that stage. So we're waiting to see if Agrizi gets a 204 or not. He could get a 105A, which basically is a plea deal. And that's what some prosecutors say should happen. Because the guy's a gunner. I mean, he was the one who was running this racket. You know, he, he should go to jail for, for something. Um, so we're waiting to see what happens there. Um, and then, of course... We've got the Guptas. Do you know who they are? <laughs> Just checking. That's Dudazani uh, Zuma. So the Guptas, of course, I mean, it's, it's an interesting story. They also arrived in South Africa in 1993 and funnily enough set up shop in, in Bedford View as well, which is like 
Gangster Central in Joburg. I don't know if you have the equivalent in, in Cape Town of a Bedford view. Just like the, the whole Atlantic seaboard, basically. <laughs> uh, so, so the Guptas arrive here, and they too set about, I mean, they played the long game, you know, where they started building up relationships with, with Zuma in the very early years. Um, they were friendly with Esau Pahad and, and even with Tabo and Becky, um, and started employing Zuma's children. Um, and, and the Guptas really had, had vision. They, they really looked long-term in, in how to capture a president. I mean, it's the most remarkable thing. And we wouldn't know a lot of this if it wasn't for the Gupta leaks and the incredible journalism that was done. Um, and, and we saw how they set about capturing state-owned entities and how they were buying mines. Um, and, 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 I mean, they literally bought up ESCOM, like a whole power utility. It's phenomenal, the scale of it, and the fact that they were able to get away with it. So all of that has been coming out, and that's largely because law enforcement agencies were depleted to, to such a massive extent. So, for example, do you know that the Hawks no longer have one chartered accountant working for them? They've all left and gone to the private sector. So to investigate something like VBS, or Steinhoff, or the Guptas. It's why the NPA lost so badly in the Supreme Court of Appeal um, on the Estina dairy farm assets um, being seized, because they just don't have that capacity anymore, unfortunately. Um, so that's the, the real concern about all of this. And then this guy over here is Roy Mudley, and Jacques Poe in his book, um, sorry? That one over there, bottom right, that's Roy Mudley. And it's alleged that he was giving Zuma, some say a million rand a month, some say 100,000 rand a month. Um, as, so, so if you think about it, um, Kreitscher was giving Zuma two and a half million, Bosasa was giving him apparently 300,000 a month, Roy Mudley was giving him a million a month. It's quite a good side income. And then that is Angelo Agrizzi, who's the Bosasa guy who's, who's giving testimony now. So the problem is, is that nothing is being done about any of this. And that's because the political will has not been there and because all of these agencies have, have been depleted. I mean, everyone harks back to the days of Tuli Madoncela and when she was the only person who was actually getting anything, anything done. Um, and unfortunately, the Hawks and the NPA under Sean Abrahams um, and under um, Burning and Lameza was just nowhere. But there is good news. So. After painting that miserable picture, I, I, do, <laughs> I do want to end with some, some positivity, because I actually am quite optimistic, believe it or not. So that's the bad news that, that I've told you about for 40 minutes. So since Cyril Ramaphosa has, has come into power, we've seen him making several appointments, which I think are very encouraging. So at the police, he appointed a permanent national um, police commissioner in Kekla Satole. He also appointed a permanent head of the Hawks, Godfrey Labia, who literally wrote the textbook on organized crime in South Africa. His doctoral thesis was on understanding organized crime. And then he appointed Peter Jacobs at Crime Intelligence, who comes from Cape Town. He was the head of crime intelligence in Cape Town, and now he heads up crime intelligence nationally. So for the first time in, in eight or nine years, we have permanent appointees in all of these positions, which for me is very encouraging. At the NPA, you know, Shamila Batoy has now been appointed as the National Director of Public Prosecutions, and for the first time ever, we had televised public interviews for, for that position, which is phenomenal. It really is in terms of transparency. At SARS, Tom Moyani has been pushed out. Um, at State Security, Arthur Fraser, who was basically running a parallel intelligence um, syndicate and had a server in his house, he's been pushed out to correctional services, even though he should be in correctional services. Um, so, so we see, and, and now Robert McBride, who knows if he's good or bad, no one really does if he's got his own legacy issues, um, has been, uh, apparently his contract hasn't been extended at, at IPID. So we're seeing all of these appointments that are happening and, and new leadership coming in, um, which I'm very encouraged by. 
The problem that we have is the lack of capacity in rebuilding it. So, for example, I spoke at the Independent Forensic um, Investigators Conference in Pretoria last year. Half the room was ex-cops and ex-prosecutors, the very best in their field. In fact, the entire Oscar Pistorius um, police investigating team practically was there because they've all gone into the private sector and started their own, their own companies. Uh, and that's the concern, is that we, we just don't have the capacity um, anymore, and we need to rebuild that. And that's a long process. Um, you know, that means changing people's mindsets. So if you're going to go and study law, or if you have children or grandchildren that are going to go and study law, um, you know, do they go and work for a fancy law firm um, and do their articles there, or do they go and become public prosecutors? Um, you know, if you uh, are an auditor, do you go work for a KPMG or a, a Deloitte that has its own issues at the moment, or do you go and work for, for the government? You know, it's about getting that, that mindset back um, and, and reinvigorating the capacity of, of law enforcement agencies. Otherwise, there's just no way that this is, is going to happen. But I am optimistic, and I do think that we're starting to see kind of green shoots and that there, there will be prosecutions. Um, but as things stand at the moment, nothing is happening. Um, and, and it needs to. So I know that the question I'm going to get asked as well, and I was sort of asked it a bit earlier already, is that we've got all of these commissions of inquiry running. What is the point of them? And, you know, I find it insanely frustrating that Angelo Agritti has been on the witness stand for a week. There have been no Hawks raids at Bosasa. I mean, they, those guys are sitting there burning documents and... I mean, I, like, he actually testified yesterday about how Gavin Watson had shredded a document and threw water in to make paper mache, um, a contract that they didn't want the SIU to find. I mean, what do you think is happening at Bosasa's campus while Angelo Gritzi is testifying? They shredding everything that they can lay their hands on. And the Hawks should be there raiding and securing any evidence that they can. So the NPA sat on this docket against Bosasa for eight years. You know, the, the SIU investigation into Bosasa should have been prosecuted eight years ago, and nothing happened because Bosasa bought the head of the prosecuting authority. It's insane. So all of this is coming out, but my view is, and we've had this debate in, the, in, in our newsrooms a lot this week and, and last week, is. What is the point of, of these commissions of inquiry? So my view is it's difficult because you should be having all of this evidence being led in court instead of having it led in a, a commission of inquiry because now Agriti is going to have to give the same evidence again in a trial. And this testimony is going to be used against him in that trial. And it could compromise the prosecutorial process. That's if we even have a prosecutorial process. But at the same time, a commission of inquiry is better than nothing at all. So at least we're hearing about it. So at least all of this is coming out, and it affects the, the kind of politics at play. So we have to remember also that it's an election year. So, for example, Wulnum Vula Mokunyani, who's been accused of getting Christmas hampers and chickens and whatever else, will she be on the ANC's list for, for the election? So, we have to understand it in, in that context as well. So the summary of that is that I think that commissions of inquiry are better than nothing, but for me it's far from ideal. I would much rather see prosecutions happening rather than this, this evidence being led in, in this kind of forum. Okay, so oh, you can't really read that. Sorry, it doesn't look, looks like it's doing something funny there. Anyway, so, so the one question just to end with that I get asked a lot is, well, what can I do about it? So people are very disillusioned, um, and I find people very negative about the criminal justice system, and that, you know, people kind of throw their hands up in despair and say, well, I'm packing for Perth and nothing is going to happen. Um, and and if there's, there's something I do want to leave you with is that in every single one of the incidents that I spoke about where there's been a failure of, of leadership, whether it be Richard Mglouli and the police, or whether it was Glynis Breitenbach or the rogue unit, it has always been civil society that has stepped in and has rescued us. 
So freedom under law with Richard and Bluely went to court to stop him from acting as a, as a police officer. Um, if you look at the social grant issue, it's the black sash that went to court to, to press that. Um, if you look at the life of Sedimeni saga for section 27, in every single one of these incidents, be it the Helen Joseph Foundation, uh, the Helen Sussman Foundation, or Freedom Under Law, or KSAC, the protection of the, the Constitution, um, it's always one of these organisations that has kind of stepped in and, and, and saved us. And that just shows the strength of civil society and how important it is to support these organisations. Um, and that means also all of us being active citizens as well. And it might sound a bit Pollyanna-ish, but I think that it's about changing a culture of, of corruption in, in the country. I mean, it means don't bribe the Metro cop when he pulls you over, or you know, don't be so dismissive of, of small-scale corruption. And, and we're seeing a lot of, of corporate corruption as well um, in uh, the, the corporate environment. And that also needs to be exposed. So whether you write letters to the newspaper, phone radio stations. If you have a particular skill, offer it to one of these civil society organizations. Support Amabungani or journalists like me. Just buy our books and give us money. Um, or, you know, in any way, because without the media, a lot of this would not have come out. You know, without the Gupta leaks, without Amabungani, without um, all, all of that, we wouldn't know about half of this and we'd still have Jacob Zuma as the president. And that's a pretty scary thought. So there is something you can do. Be active citizens, be aware, because we have to ensure that the cycle does not repeat itself again, because it keeps repeating itself. We've all seen this movie before, and we need to ensure that, that we make a noise about it and that it stops happening. Okay, so I'm gonna take a few questions. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes for, for questions. If I can ask that you ask a question and not make a statement and try to keep it a bit short. Um, at the top. Does any money ever get paid back? Because it costs a lot of money to have the inquiries. So we're having the ability to do this. Does any money ever come back? To no, no, but I don't think that's the purpose of it. So, I mean, we know that these inquiries cost a fortune. Um, and, it's, and it's been told in Parliament how much, I mean, it's millions, millions and millions, and it, it really is ludicrous. I, I've sat and reported on many inquiries. You know, I sat through the Jinwala inquiry and the Nicholson inquiry and lots of others. And often the recommendations are not necessarily binding, the recommendations. So a lot of it is just kind of ticking the box. Um, I mean, if you look at the Farlem Commission of Inquiry into Marikana, or if you look at what happened with the arms deal, I mean, it was a joke, the arms deal commission. It was a complete cover-up, uh, and it cost us a fortune. But what is the net result? So I think in the state capture um, inquiry, we're at least learning a lot. I mean, there have been bombshells. It's been revelatory, if that's the right word. Um, but I don't think anyone will get their money back at all. I mean, if anything, we've seen resignations. So we saw um, with um, the finance minister, we saw him resigning. Um, you know, so there, there has been impact, but I, I'm not convinced that it's the right way. Yeah. So I think this is a huge issue for those of you at the back. Um, what you were saying was about the scope of this, of this inquiry as well. So if you look at the terms of reference of the state capture, um, it's like shedding light on the problem. Um, so if you look at the scope of the state capture inquiry in the terms of reference, it's broad. And I mean, Zondo could be sitting there for years because we've only heard one guy from Bosasa. And so we're now going to have to hear from Numbula Mokinyani, and we have to hear from every single one of the, I think it's 34 people that he names. I mean, it, it becomes so unwieldy. How do, you, how do you rein something like that in? You know, I, I mean, and then that's just Bosasa. It's one company. Think about that. That's one company that was vying for tenders. How many more are there like that? Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think it has to happen. So, I mean, lifestyle audits are, are crucial um, because everything happens in cash. So often the evidence isn't there. Um, so I think that that's absolutely necessary and we should see more of it. But again, it's about resources. And, and do they have the resources to, to do that? But also, you know, you've got to also remember that when the system itself has been corrupted, it's difficult to actually um, have faith in, in the accuracy of something like that. Um, but but I, I personally, I'm in favor of lifestyle audits. I think it's, it's essential for us to understand. You know, if, if Numbula Mokunyani is getting, I mean, how many packs of, yeah, 100,000 chicken pieces, whatever it was. You know, we, there's a good way to, to know about it. Yeah, and how much whiskey can one person drink? Who? Sasa? I mean, the Zondo Inquiry. Oh, the Zondo Inquiry. Where does their money come from? Um, Bosasa. Yes. Bosasa. So Bosasa, it's a private company. Um, it's a facilities company. Originally, um, the, the original entity was actually um, several ANC Women's League members, like Ruthie Piccoli's wife and... Um, uh, uh, Charles and Krakula, what's, his, what's her name? And also, Viwe Mapisa and Krakula. Like all of them, they, they were all shareholders. And then the Watsons bought this entity and took it over. And they started vying for all of these tenders. But Watson was very politically connected. So they, they took that and kind of morphed it into this, this kind of beast that just corrupted everyone and got tons of tenders. So they're just private guys who have got this kind of like understated campus in Krugersdorp, and they went like the Guptas. They didn't have a big flashy compound in Saxon world. I mean, no one really cares about what's happening in Krugersdorp, <laughs> as terrible as that sounds. You know, they're not out there living at large and occupying Bartokluf. Um, sorry? It wasn't founded by the ANC, necessarily. But the Guptas are, I mean, the, the Watsons are obviously very politically connected within the ANC and have got struggle credentials. So, so that was the link. And a lot of the tenders came from their relationships with the ANC, in summary. Totally. I mean, it depends how cynical you are. So. Again, it depends how cynical you are. Look, so I mean, I think that Cyril Ramaphosa didn't have a lot of choices. So when he came into power, he was not in control of the police or the NPA or any of these, these agencies. So the only option he really had was to resort to a commission of inquiry. Um, and again, remember that it was a recommendation of, of Tuli Madonsela that was binding. And that's why he did this. Um, but you know, my feeling is that unfortunately it is giving them quite a lot of time to, to get away with stuff. Um, but already they've had years, the NPA has been sitting on the SIU report for eight years. They've had plenty of time to, to get rid of it. Um, you know, I, I do think that Ramaphosa is trying. I think that he is trying to, to clean up. Um, but you've got to remember, it took us like a decade to get to this point. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, and even though he's so entrenched in the ANC, and I mean, he was also the vice president while all this was going on, so he needs to be accountable on that level as well. Um, but again, I mean, I know that a lot of people might say, well, if the DA comes into power, it'll all, it'll all be fixed, but they've got their own problems, as you well know. <laughs> Because he who controls the door controls the drug trade. So that's so in a lot of the I mean if you look back to the nineteen nineties and, and two thousands in Joburg with Elite and Mikey Schultz and all those guys, it's very reminiscent to what's happening in Cape Town now. And if you go back in the history of, of Cape Town where you had, for example, red security and all of these different um, security organizations through the years, it's always been about controlling 
the door so that they can get their own drug dealers in. Um, and often it's the bouncers who are trading the, the drugs, and that's where the, where the money is, that's where the market is. And it's also an extortion racket. So they make a fortune of money out of extorting people. So coming in and saying, I mean, this is happening in, in Long Street all the time now, where they come in and say, well, we're in charge now, pay us a monthly retainer, otherwise we'll beat up your patrons. So that, I mean, that's what it comes down to. And it's a quite unregulated.